Hi, Dr. Abrams. Good morning, Daryl. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm super excited, as well as I'm sure our audience is, to have you uh, speak to us today. Uh, you are an integrative oncologist. Uh, you're over at, uh, where, uh, not you, uh, where are you working these yeah. days? So <laughs> I, I am an oncologist and an integrative oncologist. I've been an oncologist for 38 years. I was chief of oncology at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. And over the last 16 years, I've had an integrative oncology practice at the UCSF Osher Center for Integrative Medicine. So yeah. I always say at San Francisco General, I treat cancer. And at the Osher Center, I treat people living with cancer. Excellent. Um, and of course, the, the bad joke would be that you're treated, that you would rarely treat people who have died from cancer. Yeah. So th 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 that would be a bad joke. So we'll integrate that out of the talk. The uh, idea that uh, we're speaking to a prostate cancer audience today, can you give us an idea what percentage more or less of patients that you've worked with are prostate? That's a great question. Uh, integrative medicine is felt to be something that has wide appeal to women, upper middle class uh, in their 50s or 60s, i.e. mainly breast cancer. But uh, for some reason or another, I was looking at my clinic coming up next week and it's all men. And most of them probably do have prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is one of the most exciting group of people to work with because uh, men with prostate cancer live a long time. And, uh, have a real motivation to make lifestyle changes, which is what we focus on in integrative oncology. So one of the key sort of questions a guy new to a support group has is, I haven't been watching my diet for 50 or 60 or 70 years. I've been lazy or not so much. I don't think of myself as lazy, but obviously I'm not an athlete. Uh, you know, what good would changing any part of my lifestyle do me now that I'm diagnosed? Well, I mean, that's a multifactorial question, but uh, we know that uh, just telling a cancer patient after their diagnosis that they need to do more physical activity increases uh, their physical activity by 60 minutes a week. And that definitely improves uh, survival. Uh, we know in studies in breast and uh, uh, colorectal cancer patients that those who are more physically active significantly reduce their death from their cancer as well as all cause mortality. With regards to nutrition, uh, I generally follow the American Institute for Cancer Research World Cancer Research Fund guidelines. And studies have shown they're guidelines for preventing cancer, but number 10 says for cancer survivors, follow the nine guidelines above. And studies have shown that people who follow the guidelines uh, decrease their risk of developing a primary cancer. And even after cancer, people who eat better do better. That's why when you ask your oncologist, what, what should I eat? And they say, eat whatever you want. It doesn't really matter. That's not exactly the best advice. So eat whatever you want during radiation therapy might be good advice, though? Mm, I don't know why you would make that uh, recommendation. I think during radiation therapy, my, I'm not a radiation oncologist, but I, I believe that they don't want you to eat a lot of foods that are going to produce gas in the rectum, because if you're getting radiated to the prostate, gas in the rectum may change the beam. So I think they tend to rule out the cruciferous vegetables, which is what I like, uh, you know, people to eat a lot, but maybe not during radiation. I mean, but if they tell you don't eat blueberries because they're potent antioxidants, if it comes down to that blueberry or that beam of radiation, I think we know who wins. I think it's fine to eat an antioxidant rich diet during radiation, but I wouldn't take antioxidant supplements. Okay. So, and, and some of us don't know who wins, who actually won that argument. The beam of radiation. Yeah. Okay. Blueberries are not uh, going to beat the, that beam. Yeah. Okay. The, so we know from, I mean, we've had, talks by speakers showing their data and, and many of our, our support group members have read or discussed papers in the groups. Uh, you know, let's hear from your experience with patients though. What have you actually seen in terms of change over time between a man who shows up and actually does change 
diet or exercise or combination or something spiritual, whatever you would work out with him. What are the changes that you've witnessed? Well, I mean, I don't collect data in a, you know, a standardized fashion. So I can't say that patients that I treat do better than patients that I don't treat. But I, my gestalt is the way that my colleagues refer people to me, that they must appreciate that that's the truth, that people that we co-manage do better than people that, that I don't. And so my colleagues at the Osher Center often ask me, how are you so effective in getting patients to change their diet? And I say, I think cancer is a big motivator for lifestyle change. And I think, you know, a lot of men with prostate cancer are overweight, uh, don't eat well, eat too much saturated fat, too much animal, uh, not enough uh, plants and, and nuts and whole grains, uh, and too many eggs. Eggs really, I think, are associated with prostate cancer quite clearly. So, uh, you know, my recommendations are that people consume an organic, plant-based, antioxidant-rich, anti-inflammatory whole foods diet. And that includes increasing cruciferous vegetables, increasing whole soy foods, soybean, soy milk, tofu, tempeh, and miso, uh, not soy cheese, soy turkey, or soy hot dogs, uh, whole grains, uh, nuts, seeds, uh, decreasing uh, saturated fats. Omega-3 fatty acids in fish are good for men with prostate cancer. There was some concern from one study that if you have a high level of omega-3s in your blood, you might get more aggressive prostate cancer. But I like the study they did at UCLA where men with prostate cancer about to undergo prostatectomy were fed a low-fat diet and supplemented with fish oil supplement compared to a group that had the standard American diet and no supplement. And at the end of the day, when they had their surgery, prostates were smaller, less cancer, less aggressive cancer. And the blood from those men on the experimental diet with the, with the supplemental omega-3s uh, was more suppressive of prostate cancer cells in the test tube than blood from the men in the control group. So I, I like fish. I think fish is good. Organic poultry. Uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of dairy. Uh, there is some suggestion that calcium, uh, particularly dairy calcium, may increase the risk of prostate cancer uh, and saturated fats in red meat. And certainly the guideline says limit consumption of red meat, beef, pork, and lamb, and avoid processed meats. But the number one no is sugar. And refined sugar is no. The guideline number one is to be a healthy weight. And I do try to urge my prostate cancer patients to get their body mass index less than 25. It's something that's been shown to definitely impact on outcome. And one way to do that is to be physically active, which is a number two guideline. The number three guideline was introduced in 2007 as a new guideline, and it said avoid sugary drinks. So I was at the conference in Bethesda when they unveiled that as a new guideline, and I went to the microphone and I said, there are sugary drinks and there are sugary drinks. You can drink a cola beverage, God forbid, or a fruit punch, which is glucose and high fructose corn syrup, or you can squeeze three oranges in the morning. And the response from the podium was energetically, they're all the same. Because if you eat an orange, the fiber slows down the absorption of sugar into the bloodstream. But if you squeeze the sugar away from the fiber, it's like drinking a carbonated soft drink. So what happens? The body responds with insulin, an insulin-like growth factor, both of which promote inflammation and the growth factor is a growth factor for cancer cells as well. So that's why I'm not fond of the pomegranate juice recommendation. And I urge my patients to eat pomegranate or take a pomegranate supplement. And then the other specific prostate cancer food recommendation is lycopene from your tomatoes. But that lycopene needs to be oil extracted uh, to be bioavailable. So the Italians had it right with tomato paste and tomato sauce, or just sauteing a tomato in olive oil to activate the lycopene. And finally, green tea has been shown in Asian men living in Asia drinking green tea to decrease the risk of prostate cancer. So tea is the name of the beverage brewed from the Chinese camellia, the camellia sinensis, the so-called tea leaf. And it's graded on how oxidized the leaf is before the beverage is brewed. White, green, oolong, black, and pu'er. 
And the only two that have the cancer-fighting chemicals are white and green. Second, only to cruciferous vegetables in the potency of their cancer-fighting chemicals. And you know that sulfurophane present in broccoli and the other uh, cruciferous vegetables has been studied in men with rising PSAs after treatment of their prostate cancer. I say eat broccoli, don't take a supplement. And coffee seems to be trendy. Uh, what do you think of that? Haven't had a cup since I was 28, to be honest. I think coffee is good for the heart and the brain, as long as you don't put two things that I've already mentioned into it, dairy or sugar. Uh, there is some suggestion that we used to think coffee increased the risk of pancreatic cancer. Now they're saying drinking four to five cups a day decreases the risk of colon cancer. Well, I would think that's because your colon is probably going to be pretty empty if you drink that much coffee. Yeah. Uh, also, a trend around apple cider vinegar. Uh, I think that's yeah. bogus. Yeah, yeah, that's one of those bogus, you know, sort of uh, social media lures that out there that, you know, doesn't do anything for cancer. Yeah. And, it, you know, it's desperately difficult for men to sort of parse out what's bogus and what's not. Even that something that it, at, at, you know, just right in front of you, sticking like a curling iron up your butt to sort of raise yeah. the heat level. People do that um, innocently, you know, with the, the hope and desire of uh, positively affecting their outcomes. What do you think? I mean, how do how what's the what can we tell people who make those choices to alter those choices? You know, it, it's an excellent question. I mean, I just saw a guy on active surveillance whose disease has progressed. He just had a PSMA, you know, PET MRI, and it's in his lymph nodes, and he still wants to take his repurposed, you know, medication that's in that book that the woman cured her cancer, which is bogus. He's getting intravenous vitamin C. He's doing a million different supplements that must cost him quite a bit of money. And I said, you know, you've diseases progressed. It's recommended that you now do conventional therapy. Why don't you stop all of those things that you're doing that your disease progressed on? And he said, well, we don't know that my disease wouldn't have progressed worse if I wasn't taking that. So, you know, it really depends on how wedded the individual is to their regimen of useless supplements, uh, how hard I'm going to push them. But people that are spending a lot of money or doing things that I consider to be really harmful, uh, I will sort of try to put on my conventional oncology hat, slap them in the face and say, no, stop that. But, you know, it's a, you know, a push pull. Do you think that uh, the conversations around COVID and getting vaccinated or not have influenced the way people make treatment choices now? Uh, I haven't found that to be a huge uh, issue in my practice, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, and have you seen any changes like in weight or uh, any, in your patients over the last year and a half, two years? So, Sure. I think people that are not paying attention to being physically active are gaining you know, the COVID-19, and that's not good, especially yeah. if it pushes your BMI above 25, where I'd like it to be below that if you have prostate cancer. Yeah. So, so there are other asks. I mean, we could go through a checklist, and we've done that. with. Uh, let's just hit a uh, top-level checklist, though. Uh, vitamin D3 supplementation, your thoughts? So the only blood test that I order on patients that I see at the Osher Center is a 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Low vitamin D level puts people at greater risk for cancer and people with most types of cancer whose vitamin D levels are low just don't do as well as people whose vitamin D levels are normal. So it's what I draw. I aim for a level between 40 and 50. Many of the sort of alternative people aim for levels in the hundreds, which is too high because remember vitamin D is in charge of calcium absorption and calcium can actually increase the risk the more aggressive prostate cancer. So we want a good balance, especially men who are on hormonal therapies. Vitamin D helps get the calcium into the bones and keep the bones strong and mineralized. So again, it's the only test I order. Vitamin D, remember, is a fat-soluble vitamin. So it needs to be taken as a gel bead or a liquid and not as a white powder in a capsule or tablet complex to calcium, as many people take it to cut down on their number of pills they take because it's not as well absorbed that way. So I'm a big fan of vitamin D. You hit on 
the only blood test that I order. Why don't you order tests for testosterone free and oh uh, because I'm I'm as in my integrative oncology practice, I tell my patients cancer is like a weed and somebody else is taking care of your weed. It's my job to work with the garden and make your soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed. So my patients all have their own oncologist who's ordering their PSA and their testosterone. I, I love that characterization. Wonderful. So with that in mind, a garden isn't just uh, the seed and the nutrients. It's also the plants around it. Do you encourage uh, your patients to have more sense of community, develop new friendships, um, create more intimacy, perhaps? How do you work with that? Well, I mean, those are those are difficult things to tell people to do. I mean, if they haven't already done that, I find that uh, most patients in the old days when they would come in person would never come alone or would rarely come alone. They would bring a spouse, a child, a friend. Uh, so, you know, cancer never affects just usually one person. It affects the family, the community. Uh, I ask my patients uh, when I see them uh, one on one. Uh, three closing questions before I start to tell them about who I am and what we're going to do together. I say, uh, what brings you joy? What are your hopes? And where does your strength come from? And, you know, I'm always amazed at how articulate people can be on the spot, a doctor asking you these three questions that no doctors ever asked you before. One guy, when I was asking his wife these questions, said, what is she being interviewed for Miss America? because those are the sort of questions they ask the finalists. But uh, then I saw a woman at a conference uh, a number of years ago, and she came up to me and she said, you know, we saw you uh, before my husband died. And when you ask him those three questions, he realized that even though he was where he was on his journey, that he still had joy, hope, and strength. And that really made a big difference for the rest of his life. So, you know, that's as close as I get to recommending those sorts of things, support groups. I know my men with prostate cancer in the Bay Area here uh, really thrive on a number of different support groups that are available. I think probably those prostate cancer support groups are more successful than other general cancer support groups that many of my patients go to where they feel they don't have much in common with the other people. And sometimes they find it to be a little bit of a downer. But I think the men with prostate cancer support groups are more sort of educational and informative and looking at literature and, you know, being, again, more educational support through education and enlightenment, let's say. Yeah. And we also see anxiety reduction. Um, I mean, for example, our online groups. Uh, so they're set as the audience knows, uh, the, uh, you may not see uh, our groups are separated by stages of uh, cancer. So uh -huh. we have an advanced stage group with about 14,000 people newly diagnosed with, I don't know how many thousand, but our anxiety group has over 48,000. It's the largest of our groups. And what we find is people will sort of join our, organ, you know, mail care groups for prostate cancer information or camaraderie or, you know, hints and clues as to which doctor is good or what treatment may be available in another facility, et cetera, et cetera. But they, they stay for multiple, the ones that stay for multiple years are almost always around anxiety and anxiety. Yeah. And, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, when I always used to ask my patients to tell me their story about their cancer, uh, Many people wove a story as if stress caused their cancer. I don't think stress in and of itself, and by stress, I also mean anxiety, uh, causes cancer, but I don't think stress or anxiety is good for cancer or anything else for that matter, because stress is epinephrine or adrenaline, which kills your lymphocytes, the building block cells of the immune system, and stress is cortisol, a steroid hormone, which is an immune suppressant. So decreasing stress, I think, is really important. I usually recommend exercise. Many men tell me physical activity is good for that. I discovered yoga very late in life at age 60. Uh, but when I don't do yoga, I feel like a little old man because yoga is about strength, flexibility, and balance. But it's also moving with your breath. I always say Jewish boys can't meditate, but at the end of a 60-minute yoga class, when we do shavasana or the corpse pose, and they say, you can come back now, I feel like I've gone somewhere because just moving with my breath for an hour 
And studies have shown that in prostate cancer patients and their caregivers, that yoga is very beneficial for decreasing anxiety and stress. I also am a big fan of acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine, not only for treating the fatigue and the hot flashes that come along with androgen deprivation, but also just for decreasing stress and anxiety. When I ask my patients, what benefit do you really get from acupuncture? They often say, I just relax. And that's important. Massage is good. And I live in California and San Francisco. And many of my patients enjoy cannabis for reducing stress, uh, which I endorse and promote as a much better option than alcohol. And why, why better than alcohol? Alcohol is responsible for uh, 6% of all cancer in the United States today, and the leading cause of death uh, from cancer in people over the, the leading cause of death from alcohol in people over the age of 50 is cancer. Uh, you know, I've been a physician for 42 years, and I've never admitted a patient to the hospital from cannabis problems. The number of patients I've admitted to the hospital with problems related to alcohol use is uncountable. Mm-hmm. Do you find cannabis patients who use cannabis are challenged around weight loss uh, that, you know, they just their appetite uh, is driven well, up a bit? No, interestingly, although cannabis can induce the munchies, people who are chronic, chronic cannabis users have lower rates of obesity, metabolic syndrome and diabetes compared to people who don't use it. I could imagine many reasons for that. Uh, but the alcohol, most bad, is, alcohol yeah. is much more uh, apt to provide uh, empty yeah. calories that are leading to weight gain. In yeah. fact, my patients who stop, you asked a question that I sort of veered off on, what are the benefits I see in my patients? I can get to that now, especially patients who stop alcohol, dairy, sugar, and red meat, lose weight, stop their diabetes medicine, stop their cholesterol medicine, and stop their hypertensives, and they feel much better. No, that's wonderful. Look, t- t- you you mentioned uh, traditional um, uh, Chinese practitioners, uh, practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine. Who do you so? Who else do you involve your patients with as a consequence of your practice? I mean, you mentioned acupuncturists. Like, who else do you send people to? Well, I often recommend massage again as something that's uh, inducing relaxation. Uh, you know, we have a nutritionist at the Osher Center. But with that analogy that you like, when I say cancer is like a weed and Mm -hmm. other people are taking care of your weed, it's my job to work with the garden and make your soil as inhospitable as possible to growth and spread of the weed. I say, let's see how you fertilize your garden, what you eat and what supplements you take. So I spend about half of my new patient visit discussing nutrition. So although we have a nutrition expert, I feel patients really enjoy, again, having an oncologist say something other than it doesn't really matter, eat whatever you want. Yeah. And so I don't need to use a nutrition uh, expert. Uh, we have yoga classes. I refer patients. We have a personal trainer who works at the cancer center at UCSF, and she will uh, provide a Zoom hour long consult uh, to patients that I refer. Uh, we also have mindfulness based stress reduction program. Uh, which uh, some of my patients find useful. It's an eight-week course. Uh, I think it's an hour a week, and then it ends with a full-day silent retreat on the weekend. And uh, for people dealing with the anxiety that we discussed previously, I find that uh, mindfulness teaches you to be in the moment, not to live in the past or the present, to be here now, and don't judge your thoughts as they go through your mind. Just live with them. And it also teaches you some yoga movement. So it is something that, again, people dealing with anxiety uh, find very useful. So I might refer patients there as well. And then we also have psycho-oncology for patients who I feel need a little bit even more. We also have symptom management, and we trained one of the symptom management faculty in integrative medicine. So she's a very valuable resource as well. So And one of the, uh, before I hit on this other thing, I'm just instantly recalled a lecture I heard you give um, where you mentioned that you touch your patients. 
I mean, do I remember that correctly? And can yeah, you, you do. Uh, you know, of course, we're still doing Zoom predominantly at UCSF. Yeah. They, you know, rarely do I see a patient, but uh, even though I am a consultant and, uh, you know, it's not very important for me to examine my patients, I do feel that uh, touching the patient uh, provides a, a degree of intimacy and, you know, establishes a bond between the doctor and the patient. So, uh, in the days when I had patients coming to see me in clinic, uh, I would, in fact, do a brief exam just to have the opportunity to touch them. And, you know, I believe it's an important thing, and I, I sort of miss it. Yeah. I imagine your patients do as well, because they would derive benefit from it, as well as just feeling good having, you know, human contact. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about how you became an, a gardener, how you became a, a, an oncologist. What, what did you see as a, a, after med school when you started focusing on oncology? What did you see, feel, or try to understand th about what was missing? What was missing from what were you doing that wasn't addressing what the patients that you were seeing needed? Uh, I don't think that my path was quite that direct. I do know that as a Stanford medical student, I spent a year living in London doing various clerkships. And at one point I asked Stanford, I had found uh, uh, the Royal College of Homeopathy had an eight week uh, program that I wanted to do, but Stanford wouldn't let me do it. So that's my first inkling that I was interested in something other than conventional medicine. At the beginning of my training to be an oncologist uh, here in San Francisco, suddenly AIDS came out of the blue and we didn't know what it was or what to do about it. So I became a champion of alternative therapies even when there was no conventional therapy to be alternative to. And then when we got our first conventional therapies, I said, ooh, this isn't very good. So I wrote all the chapters in all the AIDS textbooks on complementary and alternative therapies in HIV. And then in 1992, I was challenged to study cannabis as a treatment for the AIDS wasting syndrome. And I said, okay, I can do that. I went to college in the 60s. So I fought the government and ultimately won and got marijuana and money to do research, which gave me a stronger appreciation of the power of plants as medicine, which then took me to the Telluride Mushroom Festival in Telluride, Colorado, a month after I had done my first ever jury duty and came home and said, I want to go to law school. But in Telluride, I met Andrew Weil, uh, the guru of integrative medicine, and he described a two-year online distance learning fellowship you could do with his program in integrative medicine at the University of Arizona. So I said, uh-huh, I don't want to go to law school. I want to do that. So I did, and it changed my life. You know, I saw this whole new way that we could practice medicine. And I said, you know, I'm done with HIV AIDS. I've done that for 25 years. It's very different from what I started. What I want to do now is integrative oncology, working with people living with and beyond cancer and helping them to integrate these other modalities into their conventional care. I really couldn't do that at San Francisco General, which is our safety net hospital, reaching out to socioeconomically disadvantaged patients because as I often say, for most of my cancer patients there, cancer is really the least of their problems. They're homeless, they're addicted, they're psychotic or they're undocumented. So I can't really talk to them about eating organic or doing yoga. So that's when I went over to the Osher Center in 2005 and started my practice in integrative oncology. And I'm, I'm just sort of mulling over what the Telluride Mushroom Festival <laughs> must have been like. Yeah, uh, I hope thing. it's still there. <laughs> Interesting, yeah, they, it's still, every August, still happening. Next yeah. August, it'll be fun. <laughs> I, I mean, mushrooms are interesting, and uh, in our anxiety folks, uh, the guys who are just, you know, that's what they're focused on now. They feel like they've done their therapy. They're just, you know, worried about the next PSA and hoping they don't need more therapy. I mean, a treatment therapy. But um, mushrooms seem to be on the rise, so to speak, and uh, in, in use towards uh, anxiety reduction, both prescribed and just utilized by people. Yeah. So you're talking about psychedelic. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you know, the Telluride Mushroom Festival, not to advertise for it, but it's, you go foraging for mushrooms. Uh, it's about edible, uh, medicinal, and psychedelic. So ah, I didn't realize I, it included pizza and such. But yeah, yeah. No, no. I like, uh, I like 
uh, the medicinal mushrooms. And I recommend for my cancer patients, particularly turkey tail, Trimedes versicolor, Coriolis versicolor, has been most studied in Japan and China as an adjunct to chemo and radiation for treatment of various cancers. So that's my fave. I like Cordyceps sinensis, which is a fungus that actually parasitizes a caterpillar in the Tibetan highlands that's very oxygenating and energizing. And I also recommend that often for my men with prostate cancer uh, for their male vitality. Uh, then there are uh, other mushrooms, lion's mane is becoming quite popular now because it may improve a uh, brain derived nerve growth factor. So it's something good for people who have chemo brain or neuropathy. So I'm a big fan of medicinal mushrooms, uh, capsules generally. The psilocybin issue I think is really interesting. Again, we've seen cannabis become sort of mainstream across the country. And I think the next wave is going to be psilocybin because uh, people who have uh, done psilocybin assisted psychotherapy uh, tell me all the time how it's totally changed their perception of who they were and what they were doing and where they were on their journey. Yeah. And such a rich, interesting literature just in terms of stories around discoveries of plant-based medicines or, or as you just mentioned, you know, a, a mushroom that caterpillars use yeah. in Tibetan highlands or something. Uh, I'm aware uh, um, because a family uh, in Kazakhstan, the use of dog fat uh, for different things. Um, it's, it's, there's an extraordinary world that goes beyond Western medicine that almost has nothing to do with medicine. It's just a joy to learn about, uh, you know, and how people sort of utilize the world around them. The, uh, let's talk about, as we close this out, and, and uh, so far a rich discussion that I think people will have at least one takeaway uh, to discuss with their doctors, the idea of discussing this with their doctors. When, uh, when someone's savvy in, in utilizing integrative opportunities, integrative understanding, or you know whatever phrasing people want to use, but outside of standard of care uh, uh, treatments and therapies, how should and which which I imagine is like ninety nine percent of all patient care, you know medical caregivers. Yeah. What what do the people who are listening to this now? How do they have conversations with their doctors around uh, integrating other kinds of treatments? You know, it's it's an excellent question, especially your oncologists, because oncologists are the most evidence demanding of all the medical specialties, because we deal with a very serious disease and we use relatively toxic treatment interventions. So we want to see randomized, double blind, placebo controlled trial results in the literature before we're going to embrace an intervention and recommend it to a patient. Well, we don't have randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials of blueberries, massage, yoga, tofu. You can't placebo-controlled tofu. Many people believe tofu is already placebo. So, you know, so oncologists are 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 a tough nut to crack. I, I say this because I am an oncologist as well as an integrative oncologist, and I define integrative oncology as evidence-informed as opposed to evidence-based, because we can't do all the trials to demonstrate that the interventions that we're proposing are actually gonna be beneficial, but we have enough sort of hints that they are so we can recommend them. There was a study of uh, in the UK of men with prostate cancer asking them to rank the hierarchy of the evidence they used in choosing a complementary therapy. And number one was recommendations from friends or family. And number five was scientific evidence. So that's basically the flip of how an oncologist is going to view that. And then there was another study that I often quote that, uh, as you say, maybe not 99%, but a very large percentage of cancer patients are using these interventions, and very few actually discuss it with their oncologist for fear that their oncologist will belittle them or dismiss them or tell them, you know, go find somebody that's gonna believe in what you believe in. 
So it is, it's a tight rope that we walk. Uh, there was a study that if oncologists ask a patient if they're using any complementary therapies or interventions, then that increases disclosure from 7% to 42% uh, of people who claim that they're using it. So, you know, it's a good question. I, I think you need to know your oncologist, get a feel for where they stand. I think more and more oncologists are becoming introduced to the concept and are appreciating that this is something that the people that they care for want and want to know more about. So I, I don't think I would be frightened. Uh, I would approach it, you know, and just say, oh, by the way, I'm thinking of doing this. What, what's your take? And see, see what kind of response they get. Yeah. I, I'm, um, and before we close out, I just want to hit on one and a half more things. Uh, your thoughts on homeopathic and Ayurvedic uh, medicine. Mm -hmm bogus or valuable or what? No, so a traditional Chinese medicine really speaks to me. I feel like maybe I was a practitioner in a past life. Ayurveda, the, med the medicine of ancient India, I have less uh, ease getting my head around the different doshas and da 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 and, and the interventions. Uh, I, I am a bigger fan of Chinese medicine than Ayurveda. Homeopathy, uh, which I mentioned I did want to study uh, when I was in medical school, I've sort of uh, I have a textbook of uh, integrative oncology that I co-edited with Andrew Weil. And in the first edition, uh, we had a chapter on homeopathy that I deleted in the second, because I just don't think that there's really a place for homeopathy for perhaps other than Arnica cream uh, or Arnica mouthwash in, in cancer treatment. I, I don't think people need to spend money or time doing homeopathic interventions. Okay, and finally, uh, uh, the idea. So, as you probably know, male care is focused on underserved communities, uh, black men, gay men, et cetera, uh, Native American men. Uh, uh, do you have any sense of disparities in outcomes or um, uh, way people utilize integrative medic uh, therapies and treatments? Yeah, well, again, I think that, uh, you know, first of all, there's good evidence that African-American men do seem to have more uh, difficulty with prostate cancer, being diagnosed at a younger age, often having more aggressive disease. I don't think the same is true for other uh, uh, minorities. Uh, I think that in my experience that those are people that are not coming to see me as frequently as, uh, you know, more uh less, uh, you know, the, the, the general population of, of straight white men who I, I tend to see more frequently. Yeah. All right. Uh, final words for our audience from you? Uh, eat well, move your body and decrease your stress. Very nice. Uh, yeah. And keep enjoying life. Yeah. You know? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, Dr. Abrams, uh, a pleasure for me. I'm sure a pleasure for the thousands of people watching this and uh, we're ever grateful for your time and being part of Mail Care's faculty now. Thank you for that. My pleasure. Thanks, Daryl. Okay.